If you were to do the exams, you wouldn't have them done. No, wait, there's still retakes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, just wait, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, What's my drink? Right, those are the ones that I see where I sort of barely did any work. That was the one. That I did pass in the retake, but it wasn't that. Right. Software engineering, I did nothing. And then that one I did nothing. So I don't have a hand in any book. And that one's affected by the fact that <coughs> the object will be very programmed and keep up with that, so that feeds into that. Yeah. Um, just in terms of knowing shit. Oh, really? So you don't know much about that? No. I know about Java, but not. I'm Java Queen, so I Wait, this is from last year or from this year? This is from last year. This is last year. This is this year. So far. You managed to pass that, though. Yeah. You passed that. I passed that, and I passed that. I passed that by 40, and that by. Yeah. So you, what you have to do is read, you can retake them all your quarter. Find out if you can retake them. Well, I mean, we can just be in case it's doing the work. Yeah. Yeah. And for software engineering, do you? <coughs> was this the stuff where you have to do like six different apps or something? Like seven apps? There was an exam, and then there were like, I mean, I've got more for the exam. Anyway. You shouldn't shut up to the, to the labs because there's so many people who actually did the work. Okay, it looks like we've got uh, enough punters, so we'll get underway. This is the, the last lecture that I will do with you before handing over to Dr. Dabrovka, who will take you on to the second half of this course, which is the application of everything I've been dealing with you so far. If you liken it to a bit of a mountain climb so far in weeks one to five, we'll be just covering... We're in the foothills. We haven't even started to climb the mountain yet. So I've shown you what a, a pickaxe is and how your, foot, your shoes and boots work, etc. to start to climb the mountain. But the real <laughs> purpose of this course is how do you get a signal, an optical signal, a microwave signal, to propagate. And to propagate with high efficiency over long distances. And if you've got multiple channels also operating, so all of Maxwell's equations, the boundary conditions that we're going to talk about now, <coughs> material properties, they're all just foundation work. The real purpose of the course is in the, the second half from next week on to the end. So this pretty much summarizes where we got to last Tuesday. And we arrived at the so-called uh, general or macroscopic Maxwell equations. And they were taken from the, the microscopic form of Maxwell's equations. That's where Maxwell's equations apply in so-called free space. And the free means space that's devoid or empty of any stuff, any material. So this, this first law is the general differential form of Coulomb's law. <coughs> so if you have to give it a name... Coulomb's law. Likewise, this was <coughs> Faraday's law. This one here doesn't really have a name as such. It just says, I know magnetic monopoles. And I'll put here, yet, because tomorrow morning you may wake up and read the metro and discover that all of a sudden someone has just discovered a magnetic monopole. 
and you'd have to change all of, uh, well, at least that law of Maxwell's equations would have to go from equal to zero to equaling some sort of density, a magnetic density of some kind. And this one also was Ampere's law. Plus, this was, remember, this was uh, the, the genius or the insight that Maxwell had. There's the Ampere, Ampere's law bit, but the bit he added in order to have satisfaction of the conservation of charge for the continuity equation was the addition of this term here. And that was the conservation of charge. You stick here via the continuity equation. And we also uh, moved on to, to understand what these new field quantities were because what we realized is that <coughs> there was a primary field that was acting on a system. And the primary field in this case is either going to be the electric field or the magnetic field. And they induce a reaction field. And the reaction field was a displacement vector and also a magnetic intensity. Now these are effectively pseudo fields uh, because they're really an admission of ignorance about the fact that you don't know how much internal charge has been created when you apply a primary field upon the material, and likewise you don't know how many internal current loops are generated to create extra magnetic character. So what we have, for example, is um, some boundary, and this is just some arbitrary curvature between two materials, so that um, we can talk about a relationship that connects <coughs> the electric field, and here's the the displacement vector. So there's the primary field. We you can put here acting field. And this one is going to be the response. The response field. And there was a proportionality between them. And the constant of proportionality we had a matrix equation. So to expand what the matrix equation was, we had um, a vector with an x component, a y component, and a z component. So the column vector like that. <coughs> That's related to the primary components of the acting electric field which has its own x, y, and z components because this system, so this, on this side of the, the boundary, for example, you could have a system that's characterized by uh, a dielectric permittivity of one kind, and on the other side, a dielectric permittivity of another kind. And in here, we can have some arbitrary coordinate system. So there's our x-axis, y-axis, z-axis. Who, who knows how it's uh, constructed? But this global coordinate system determines where the boundary exists. So on one side you've got one material, on the other side you have some other material. And We had, in general, explicitly write out, in this occasion, each of the elements of the operator matrix. So normal convention is that the, the subscript, the first subscript, is the, the row address. So we've got row x, <coughs> row y, 
and row Z. The second subscript in the index notation is the column vector. So you've got column X, column X, column X, column Y, Y, and column Z. So for example, what you might have here is that uh, you've got um, air. Air might be on this side of the boundary and it would have a matrix one, one, one. So effectively, if you multiply anything by unitary matrix, it leaves things unchanged. Whereas, for example, if we've got a, a radio beam, so here's a, a plane wave front of a radio beam. So this is a, a line of equal phase. We'll meet this more in the second half of the course with uh, Dr. Brocker. But there's your propagating wave. It's coming from air and it's going into another medium. Let's say well, water is a typical example. And in that case, you would have a matrix of this kind of form, where you, instead of unity on the main diagonal, you've now increased the polarization response where you actually condense the field so heavily that it's now 80 times greater than what air does. And this effectively is what's going to lead to Snell's law of reflection and refraction. Ref reflection and refraction that you'll meet uh, next week. Likewise, we had the response field for the magnetic case of the uh, magnetic intensity. And remember that it was proportional to the applied um, magnetic field. Oh, yeah, well, I'll just note here that in general, the elements in the permittivity matrix, so you can hear the, this is the permittivity, are going to be functions in quite a, in a general sense, very complex functions of frequency. So as you change the frequency of your radio beam, this is going to become a very dynamic matrix. It's a frequency dependent ma matrix and generally can be very complicated. So it can have the effect of causing your radio beam, if you, if you polarize the electric vector of your radio beam, it can undergo rotation and all sorts of other uh, phenomena. In terms of the uh, magnetic field, you've got your component response in terms of magnetic intensity. And here, we again can resolve things into the axis of the system, whatever our coordinate system happens to be. And we talked about a permeability. And it, again, <coughs> in terms of a, an operator matrix or a two-dimensional tensor is composed of nine elements. So we're knowing the rows, first of all, is the X row, Y row, and then the Z row. And likewise, the X column, the Y column, and the Z column. And similarly, the elements in that will be some complex function of frequency. This is what they refer to as gyromagnetic material. So gyro or gyrotropic means you've got some spinning of the the electric vector or the magnetic vector in the radio beam. So all this really is just a summary of what we got to last week. So I'm just extending a little further of where we got up to. So we had 
Coulomb's law, Faraday's law, Ampere's law, and the fact that there are no monopoles. And then we've got this additional conservation of charge. So today, what we're going to look at is how do we maintain continuity of the fields across the boundary? Yep. Sorry? Here? That's the frequency. So, absolute frequency. So, I'm using absolute frequency here as opposed to angular frequency. Sometimes we'll read angular frequency in textbooks. I'm not talking about that here. This is absolute frequency. Otherwise, you can, textbooks will have the symbol F. But that's otherwise reserved for a different quantity. So, always new. Rig that and new means frequency in this in this subject. <coughs> so, just to give you some background as to what we're aiming at. If an electric field is operating in this space. We have to maintain distinction between the field E, D, B, and H. The electric field and magnetic field in these two regions will remain unchanged. But the response of these two regions to either the electric or magnetic field could be different. That's why we need to maintain the distinction between them. So, you would say that uh, if an absolute if. If the whole world homogeneously <coughs> consisted of only one material. All the previous theory would be useless. D with I don't need to put the seal there and all you need to do would be to replace uh, the magnetic intensity by uh, whatever the permeability was <coughs> So that's saying that if, if, I mean, it's a ludicrous thought, but the idea is that if, for example, there was, there was no variation whatsoever in material throughout the whole universe, it means you wouldn't have a discontinuity, a spatial discontinuity, such as this boundary line here between one material and another, which means all of these formulas that we have here would be pointless. Since all you'd have to do would be to put down what the material parameters are, in relation to the primary field and just chug away with uh, the Maxwell equations. But because there are real materials, that leads to the discontinuities, these things, and we have to be able to handle those. So just to continue on with that point, 